Good evening, good evening. Good to see you tonight. We got a couple minutes before we start. We're going to invite all of our men and uh, young men over here to the prayer room uh, with the preacher for tonight. And so, teenagers and men, if you can join us, and uh, we'll give everybody a minute or two to get over here, and then we'll begin praying together.
evening. We welcome you to our Monday night revival service and glad that you're here and uh, glad you didn't let the devil bring up anything to keep you away. And uh, we're excited about God meeting with us again and uh, as we worship him. So let's start off by singing. Let's all stand together, if you will, if you want to use your hymnals, M380. Revive us again. Remember, revivals for God's people. And our prayer is that God does a work and he begins in me, my heart, your heart. And uh, from that, who knows what the Lord would want to do here in this work, in this community. So let's sing this together, uh, the first, the third, and last verse as we worship him. Sometimes, church, we're guilty of just letting it be a song. Just letting it be words off of our lips that make it a foot or two out and fall and hit the ground. Would you join me tonight? Let's make that our prayer. Man, the men just prayed. I'm going to invite everybody who will. Ladies, get with some ladies. Let's get around this altar for a few minutes. And would you do this if you can't kneel? Get on one of these front pews. God understands. And let's beg God to revive our hearts tonight. Would you do that? Let's move to the altar right now and let's just spend a few minutes praying. God, speak to my heart. God, do a work in my life. Do a work in my marriage. God, do a work in my children. Or do a work in our church, Lord. Use me at my workplace. I firmly believe, church, that if we as God's people will truly be revived in our hearts, The community will be drawn. The lost will be drawn to see what God is doing. But it's got to start with us. Just pray and beg God to do a special work in your heart tonight.
dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you once again, humbly crying out, Lord, for you to show up tonight in a special, special way. Lord, I believe everyone here would check the box that we certainly want you to revive us again or to do a work, but so often we're nonchalant about that. Lord, it's just words. It's not a desire of our heart. Father, right now I pray you will hear the humble cry or the people gathered around this altar. And Lord, you'll send a revival in our hearts. Lord, you'll do a work that only you can do. Lord, your Holy Spirit will move and have free reign. Lord, to challenge us, to convict us, Lord, to change us. Lord, to genuinely do something in our hearts, Lord, that changes how we live, changes how we go about life, changes how we treat others and love others. And people notice a difference, Lord. They notice that you're doing something in our lives, Lord, that may draw them Lord, to come and see the power of our almighty God. So, Lord, continue to meet with us. We've already asked you to anoint your messenger tonight. Give him a power and liberty as he preaches. And, Lord, as he's a spirit-filled speaker, may we be spirit-filled listeners tonight. As your Holy Spirit draws us and speaks to us, may we not allow anything to get in the way to keep us from being obedient and allowing you to work. But, Lord, we'll be responsive allow you to fulfill the work that you desire to do in our lives. Oh God, meet with us, we pray in a special way. Make your presence known. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Boy, we hope that's your desire. And we do welcome you to Monday night of our revival service. I know for many of you it's been Monday all day, hasn't it? And uh, boy, it's just good uh, for us to make sure our minds are clear, our hearts are ready and prepared for what God wants to do. We can pray for the evangelists that come through, Brother Austin yesterday, Brother Nate uh, tonight, and boy, we can pray that they'll be spirit-filled and have the power of God on their life, and uh, they can and will and have, but if we're not ready... If we're not in the spirit, ready to receive uh, what God sends through his messengers, uh, then we miss an opportunity uh, for God to do something in our lives. So I trust that you, you are and you're praying, God, speak to me and uh, change my life and do a work in my heart. We're going to go right back to singing here in just a minute, but I want to acknowledge two things quickly. Uh, Miss Brenda, good to have you uh, back in service with us tonight. If uh, we did not have any results uh, uh, Sunday, but because of all her care for Brother Ed back and forth, as you can her, imagine, her stress has been on the rise a little bit, and doctor said she needed to rest a little bit. She was having a couple of issues, and she was able to finally get in over to Greenville. And so let's pray for Miss Brenda, but she texted me today, so I'm sure hoping to be a revival. And so we're glad to see you tonight. And, uh, and then one individual you don't see is Brother Ronnie, who sits right here. Uncle Nate, you can see his footprints in the carpet there. And uh, his brother died. We told you that. And so he took off, J.D., he took off uh, with his other brother here in town uh, to go see uh, the family and all the arrangements there. So you be praying for Brother Ronnie. We don't have a way to communicate with him while he is there. And so if we do hear anything, uh, we will let you know. All right, let me mention two other things to you, and then we're going to sing some more. Uh, thank you for how you, we've been keeping you uh, post, uh, not only with our missionary, Brother Grisha, uh, there in Moldova, but also uh, Brother Pavel, and uh, through the efforts that we've been a part of in sending funds there to Brother Pavel as of about 36 hours ago. Uh, he's already been able to lead four individuals to the Lord uh, during uh, the transportation of these refugees and feeding them, but being able to speak to them and share with them even at the border. So praise the Lord for that. These lives are being eternally changed. And uh, the many of you saw we were a blessing to our missionary, and he's trying to prepare, not knowing what is going to uh, come. Uh, uh, after this war, we know Moldova has no uh, shield, no army, and so they're all preparing 
uh, to fold easily if things continue in this direction. And so we sent him some funds to be able to help uh, him be able to grow his own garden and uh, uh, his food that way. And so those of you on social media, you saw that picture today. And uh, he texted me. And, uh, boy, you could just, you could, you know, there it is right there. And you could see the, uh, the smile in the text almost, uh, even without the picture, uh, how he was already out there preparing. He's just so grateful. And uh, uh, we want all of you to be able to meet Brother Grisha, but he's just so grateful of uh, that little extra uh, that we were able to do as a local church to help him. And uh, so thank you for uh, being a part of impacting their lives continually. As I promise you, they're on the ground uh, doing their mission and uh, trying to do all they can, especially during these times uh, right now, to impact others for the cause of Jesus Christ. So let's keep praying uh, for them as well, but thank you for having a part and doing that. Ladies, you come back up here, and let's all stand together, if you will, please. We're going to sing a couple of songs uh, here before we receive our offering as we continue to turn our attention uh, to the Lord and to thank Him for what He did for you and uh, for who He is and for what He desires to do in our hearts. Jesus, Messiah, and let's sing a couple of these verses together as we offer our praise to the Lord.
good singing tonight. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. And uh, we thank you for joining in as we offer our praise to the Lord. We're going to receive an offering uh, for the next few nights. And I uh, want you to know this is your opportunity uh, to be a blessing to the men that God has sent our way uh, this week. And uh, everything you give tonight uh, will go directly uh, towards them, their families, and their ministries. And they're so honored to have both. Brother Austin and Brother Nate with us this week, and uh, know that they are bringing God's messages to us, and boy, God gave us a great start yesterday, Brother Austin, and really two good thoughts, and I mentioned to you uh, yesterday about sometimes I believe a lot this happens in our generation, uh, we, we plan a revival and all the things surrounding revival, and, and sometimes we do it all for the wrong reasons. And we like to bring somebody in that's going to make us laugh and somebody's going to entertain us a little bit and somebody's going to preach a message, you know, that everybody talks about. But, man, we just need the Word of God. And we got that yesterday, and uh, we know that we're going to get that tonight as well. And so I thank you for how you started that off and just followed the Lord and, uh, and just preached the Word of God. And I'm praying that once again tonight the Word of God will stir our hearts, challenge us, change us. And uh, so let's be faithful to give to these men. How we'll do it is just uh, if you have a love offering you want to give, and uh, we'll just have all sections move at the same time tonight. The men already have the plates prepared before you. And so if you have a love offering that you want to contribute towards this cause, uh, then we invite you after we pray to uh, bring that forward, and we'll be sure to be a blessing to these men in this way. All right, let's pray and uh, ask the Lord to bless this uh, offering and the remainder of our service uh, tonight. Brother David, there in the back, could I ask you to lead us.
blessing, and uh, thank you for that reminder. Our lady's going to come sing for us at this time, and uh, we are going to be having the Revival uh, Kids Club, and so we'll dismiss the kids here in just a minute after the special music, uh, but we pray this song will be a blessing to your hearts.
Amen. Aren't you thankful we serve a risen Savior? <laughs> he is our living hope today. And if you don't know him, whether you're in this service or watching online, we invite you uh, to meet Jesus today. Get your Bibles ready as you're doing that. We're going to dismiss our Revival Kids Club. And uh, so, guys, you go out. You'll be in the old sanctuary right over here to my right, your left, just up the ramp. And uh, Brother James leading that tonight. I appreciate his willingness to uh, teach. Man, oh, look at it. They got their Bibles. They're going to be getting a bunch of Bible books tonight. And that's awesome. And you remember, you hang on to them. Parents, you help them. I'm, I'm sure you want to remind them. And then at the end of the week, uh, they'll cash those in on Thursday night. And they're so thankful to have uh, Brother Nate, and uh, I was calling him Uncle Nate, and somebody said, you need to call him Brother Nate, because you said Brother Austin. <laughs> and I said, well, uh, he is Brother Nate, he's also Uncle Nate, and uh, so good to have uh, Aunt Becky here as well, and I'm glad she could make the service tonight, and uh, Uncle Nate doesn't need any introduction here, I know, and it is hard to believe that we're in our 10th year here, and uh, I was thinking about this as we were praying about him coming. He's not done a full meeting for us. You, you were a part of a meeting, I believe, in the old sanctuary where you came a night or two and, and preached, and uh, he's going to take care of tonight through Wednesday uh, night for us, and so thankful for his life. I, I'm curious of this. I don't know. I haven't really thought through this. Um, how many of you maybe heard his preaching as a teenager? Um, he used to travel all over. Anybody here uh, tonight? A few. Okay, a few of the younger generation, right? Absolutely. <laughs> You're not so young, if that's true. And uh, But uh, all over, all over, the Lord used uh, Uncle Nate uh, to preach and uh, to youth and conferences, local churches, and you know he's a local church pastor in the Cary area. That is no uh, uh, surprise to any of us. And recently, you know, because we've been praying and uh, supporting continually uh, his uh, ministry at the Southeastern Free Will Baptist College, stepping in while shouldering uh, the pastorate as well, uh, leading the college as the president. And we're so thankful for him. It's good to have many college students with us tonight and go ahead and acknowledge you now and uh, see out of our five there we got at least three back home uh, plus a couple additions and uh, so we still end up with five tonight and uh, we're so thankful to be able to send our students there and uh, so thankful for God's hand on your life and leading him so let's give him a warm wildwood welcome as he comes to preach the word of God for us tonight would you please <coughs> It's great to be in God's house. Please take your Bibles and turn, if you would, please, to Ephesians chapter number 6. We'll be there in just a moment. Also, if you don't, if you just kind of hold your finger there and turn back to Luke's gospel chapter 11, and we'll be uh, in just a few moments into the Word of God tonight. Uh, just doing a little reminiscing while we're, my first time in this auditorium, and I, I, this is beautiful. I thank God that He's provided this. Amen, church? Uh, it's amazing, and uh, I preached uh, in the old building many times over the years. I was thinking, sitting down here in the front row, I was thinking about Brother Larry. Uh, Brother Larry uh, Ball, the pastor at the church uh, many years, dear friend of mine, and he and I message each other every week and from Corinth, Mississippi to Cary, North Carolina, and we talk back and forth, and he and Terry have been dear friends of ours uh, through the years. I, I thank God for um, Jonathan. I remember him as a young, young boy growing up. And uh, even then, uh, the seriousness he had about the things of God. And, um, you know, I, I'm so thankful. You get to that juncture in life where a young man who's talented in a lot of ways, and Jonathan is, he's very talented in athletics, he's talented in other, very other, he could go on in the business. Uh, but he came to that juncture in his life and he chose to follow the ministry call. And I praise God, I see Lindsay up here and I see the kids and how God has blessed them. And when we get together for uh, the times at Christmas over the years and fellowship together and just see one another ministering in the things of God, it thrills our soul that the gospel is still the best way to live. There's no, there's no greater way to live than the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Greatest calling and uh, I'm thankful for my brother, being able to share ministry with Phil tonight in, the, in this service in Carolyn, and we've been in the work of God for many years together, and it's just a joy to see friends, uh, college students, and uh, best of all, it's to have my wife here. She is my life partner in ministry. Uh, it's always been Nate and Becky, 
Everything we've ever done from the first youth group we ever had through, through the ministry, through building a mission church, through uh, the work in evangelism where we traveled the country, it was always together. She homeschooled on the road while we traveled, and she did our children in a different classroom every week. Uh, it was a unique school. And, uh, and then uh, to see God uh, bring us to the college in these days and see the young people that are training, uh, 23 preachers on campus right now, amen? Uh, we need preachers more than ever before. And I thank God for the young ladies that are also uh, standing true to the Word of God, preparing themselves for service. And uh, I won't say a lot about that, but I love the college. I love what God's doing there. And I'm so thankful for being a tag partner, tag team partner with Brother Austin. You know, if you've ever been in a wrestling match, the little guy gets out there and he, does, you know, he scraps around a while. But then when he gets tired, he tags the big guy. And, and this is the big guy right here. And so we're tag team partners in revival, okay? And I'm so thankful to be able to share this ministry with Brother Austin. And he and I are just uh, rejoicing that God put us together. Brother Wayne's now on our staff at the college uh, full time. Brother Wayne Price, amen? What an addition. What a blessing. All these men are. God just continues to add uh, to the college ministry. And we believe that he's going to send out workers all over the fields for the last days. And these are exciting days. All right, let's stand for the reading of God's Word with you with me, please. Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, and then we will also be looking in a moment at Luke chapter 11. When we look at the passage that Paul is saying in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand or to still be standing. In other words, Paul says we're engaged in a battle uh, with the devil and with all the principalities of darkness. And uh, we understand that that has intensified in these days. And we know that it is going to get darker. And the devil is going to seek uh, to capture an entire generation. But the Apostle Paul says that we need to take on the devil. And we need to take him on. And we need to come with the armor of God fully covered, fully prepared uh, with all of the armor and then... He says in verse 18, look at verse 18. This is our key verse and text verse tonight. <clears throat> Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, that is in the Holy Spirit, not just praying. Praying with all prayer and supplication in the Holy Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication uh, for all saints. Here the Apostle Paul said, once you put on the armor of God, in this con uh, conflict with a real enemy called the devil, then you go to your knees in prayer. And the word watching here means sleeplessness. So it means to be praying while other people are sleeping. That, that is what the Apostle Paul is saying. If you're going to take on the enemy, you've got to get serious about the battle. If you want victory in your life, victory in your family, victory in your church, then you are going to have to pray while other people are sleeping. Watching means sleeplessness in prayer, persevering. Notice that word in verse uh, 18, persevering. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, very important. Word, not just praying, praying in the Holy Spirit, praying while other people are sleeping, but persevering in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Word of God. Now I pray that you'll anoint your servant in these lips of clay, and I pray that you'll speak through me eternal truths, and I pray, Lord, that people will hear with the hearing of their soul, and Lord, by, because they receive the word of God on the inside, they'll be transformed, changed by your word. Lord, I pray that you will call us, call us to be equipped to defeat the devil. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated and thank you for standing. So the Apostle Paul said it's not just praying, but it's praying with all perseverance 
and it's praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, many times the Holy Spirit is ignored when it comes to preaching and praying. But there is no real praying apart from the Holy Spirit. There is no real preaching without the Holy Spirit of God. And for us to neglect prayer is to tell the Lord that we don't need Him. That we can teach, we can sing, we can preach, we can pray without His assistance. But well, the Bible calls us to prayer. And God calls us to continue in prayer and to depend upon the Holy Spirit in prayer. Because He prays for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Can you imagine when we're in touch with heaven and the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit is praying on our behalf? That He's praying to the Father according to the will of God. On our behalf, our marriage, our family, we pray one thing, the Holy Spirit converts that prayer and He prays with groanings which cannot be uttered the will of God in our lives. It is interesting that real doers throughout all history have been prayers. All of them haven't been preachers. All of them haven't been singers. All of them haven't been gifted in various ways. But all real doers in the work of God have all been prayers. They understood what it was to pray while other people were sleeping. To pray in the Holy Spirit, not just pray prayers, not just say prayers, but praying under the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. This is what Paul is talking about here. We're in a real conflict with a real devil. He wants your family. He wants your marriage. He wants this church. He wants to destroy. He wants to divide and destroy. He has a plan. And we cannot defeat him in our lethargy, our apathy, our attending services, our occasionally reading a devotion. We have to get serious about prayer. And if we are going to defeat the devil in our life, then we're going to have to win this battle against the flesh. And we're going to have to determine we're going to pray through. That's one of the old timers' terms that's not used much anymore. Praying through to victory. Praying through until the devil departs. Praying through until God's hand is on our marriage. Praying through until God rescues our children. Praying through for revival. And so we understand the devil is, he, he, he is afraid of nothing. He's not afraid of our preaching. He's not afraid of our singing. He's not afraid of our nice buildings. He's not afraid of all of those things. He's not afraid of our college. He's not afraid of all the literature that we distribute. While we hand out a few gospel tracts, and we ought to, and try to get out Christian litter, the devil is bombarding the world with pornography. He's taking a whole generation by storm. While we put out a few little efforts here and there, he is not afraid of our large crowds and our celebrations. He is not afraid of our academic institutions. It's amazing to me that every Christian school, the devil signs up and enrolls. I don't know how the devil gets in Christian schools and he especially gets in the senior classes. But he seems to get in because he's not afraid of our academic institutions. The only thing that the devil fears is when the weakest child of God gets on his knees before an almighty God, the devil trembles. He's not afraid of you. He's not afraid of me. He's afraid of God. He's afraid of God. And our connection to God is praying always. And praying in the Holy Spirit. And praying while others are sleeping. Hey, the devil doesn't sleep. He's always busy doing his work. Conniving, deceiving, destroying, dividing. And so I challenge us tonight to lay hold of the omnipotent weapon of prayer that God has put in every believer's hand. 
down to the little child, to the teenager, to the single adult, to the young married couple, to the elderly person that is widowed, or to the family who's trying to build a family for God, the omnipotent weapon. Ephesians 3.20, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power. The power is in prayer. And because the reason we have so much powerless preaching is because we have so much prayerless preaching. And what we need is to be brought back once again to persistent prayer, as it's called in the text. Persistent prayer. Now, Jesus made a practice of getting up every morning before others and praying. And we have many times recorded in Luke's gospel where Jesus went alone in the mountain to pray. Or he went alone to the garden to pray. And Luke particularly is the one who would refer us to Jesus on his knees. Now, I understand who Jesus is. Uh, He is God in the flesh. He, He, my friend, has all authority and all power in heaven and in earth. And yet he found it necessary to get up before other people did. And go to a place of prayer and meet with his father. And he said, I do nothing without my father's assistance. I preach nothing without my father. I speak nothing without my father. Because I've been talking to my father today. What does it take to keep us out of the prayer closet? Very little. Very very little. We have a lazy generation And it's really frightening when you look at young people today, and I love young people, but we have a lazy, undisciplined flesh that would rather feast than fast, play than pray, watch television than study God's Word. If we just put one-third of the time in prayer that we put here, what would God do? He would shake the world. The devil would tremble. But we've been distracted. And it's a delusion of the devil. Look over here. Do this, do this, do this. Do this in ministry. Do this in ministry. But don't pray. And so Jesus was a prayer. Chapter 11, verse 1, he was praying. And when he ceased praying, notice in verse 1, the disciples looked at the Lord and said, Will you teach us? To pray just like you just prayed. I mean, how many times did they hear Jesus groaning and praying and crying on his face stretched out somewhere? And then the disciples finally got the courage and said, Lord, would you teach us to pray like that? They saw the power that was on his life. They saw there was a residing power on the Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, he was the son of God. But he submitted himself to the Father. And he prayed. How's your connection with heaven? How's your connection with the Almighty? We can talk about denominational connections. We can talk about uh, we like this music, we like that music. We, we, We like this kind of preaching. But how's your connection heaven Uh, think with me for just a moment because when we look through history everyone that God ever used understood what it was to pray in the Holy Spirit I mean if you go through Bible history you you see Elijah praying and fire fell down from heaven it was a short prayer but he'd already been praying three and a half years (laughs) When there was no water in the land. There was a famine in the land. And he'd already been in prayer for three and a half years. No wonder he could pray a prayer of less than 70 words. And the fire would fall. Because he had made it a habit of being alone with God in the secret place. And the Bible says that there will be no victory over the devil apart from prayer. I'm going to say it again. You can go to church, you can read your Bible, you can check off the list, but with a part from prayer, there will be no power in your life. The devil will not flee. 
But we understand that the Bible has testified through all the Old Testament, all the New Testament, and all of church history. But if you call unto me, I'll answer thee, and I'll show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Things that you could not even conceive God can do. Amen? God can do. God can do. And so we find that the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. So he obliged them. He said, okay, when you pray, say, our Father, which art in heaven, you see in verse 2, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so on earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, watch it, but deliver us from evil. You know what the literal translation of that is? Deliver us from the wicked one. Deliver us from the devil. A real devil who's out to destroy your life. Destroy your testimony. How real it is. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. If we could see the demonic powers that are trying to hinder this revival in Wilson, North Carolina, this week, there's not a one of us that would not get on our knees before God and cry out for his assistance and help. But because we don't see it, it's not flesh and blood, we don't pray. We don't take the time necessary to push sleep away to pray and to get a hold of heaven because the devil is not afraid of us. He's afraid of God. And we need to learn to pray powerful prayers, effective prayers, fervent prayers, prayers that back up the enemy defeating the devil in our lives. So Jesus gave them a model prayer, as we know. But he wasn't finished. That was the instruction. Now the illustration. He gives the illustration. He said unto them, verse 5, are you there? Luke eleven five. 5, say amen. All right. He said unto them, which of you shall have a friend? Everybody understands that, having a friend. And shall go unto his friend at midnight and say unto him, friend, friend, lend me three loaves. Now I want you to notice how Jesus particularly chose the time. He chose the time as midnight. Not like midnight in America when we turn off the news or ball game and it's midnight. No, this was the middle of the night. They went to bed at sundown. It's the dead of night. He goes to his friend at midnight and he says, would you lend me three loaves? He said, a friend of mine in his journey has come to me and I have nothing. Would you just circle the word nothing? When are we going to get to the place where we can say honestly to God, I have nothing. Oh, we're so used to saying I'm rich and increased with goods. I have this. I have education. I have this. I I, I live in America. I have so many possessions. I have such a wonderful family. When are we going to get to the place where we say I have nothing apart from you? Take away the grace of God and we have nothing. We're stripped bare. And God wants to remind us of that. The man did not have bread. So he went to his friend at midnight and said, I need some bread. I don't have anything to set before my guest. And he from within shall answer and say, trouble me not. This is Jesus talking now. Trouble me not. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. Now, what did they do in that culture? They put the kids to bed, all in one bed, all in one bed, no matter how big the family was. And then they locked and latched the door until morning, and they did not allow anyone to come in. It was dangerous. They had to, they had to lock the door. No one enters. He said, so the children are in bed, and I cannot give you bread. Sorry. And then verse 8, he said, I say unto thee, though he will not rise... And give him, because he is his friend, 
Yet because of his importunity, would you circle that word in your Bible? That is an important prayer word. Because of his importunity. Because of his persistence. Because of his continuous asking. His shamelessness. Because of his importunity, he will arise and give him as many as he needed. So you get the illustration, right? The man had guests that came to his house unexpectedly. And he went to the cupboard and the cupboard was bare. And there was no 24-hour Walmart. He had no food to set before his guests. So he said, ha, ah, my neighbor's a mile away. I'll go to my neighbor's house. So he, in the middle of the night, he goes to his neighbor's house. And the guy opens the window. He's not going to open the door. And he looks out and he said, hey, man, what, what? He said, hey, I got people at my house and I have nothing to give them. I, I have nothing to set before him. Will, will you please share with me some bread? Bread meaning food? Would you, would you share with me some bread? And the man said, are you crazy? Have you, you know what time it is? Wham! He shuts, closes the shutters. So about an hour later, he goes back to his neighbor's house. He wakes him up again. His neighbor opens the shutters. He looks out. He said, you again. He said, yeah, man, I need bread. It's not for me. It's not for me. It's for other people. There's people hungry at my house. They need to be fed. I need bread. I'm not asking bread for myself. I'll do that in the daytime. Give us this day our daily bread. But now it's nighttime. And I need bread for others. Will you give me bread? And Jesus said he would not give him bread because he was his friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. We sing it a hundred times. And, and, and my friend, that's a good song. Nothing wrong with that song. But you, you don't get your prayers answered because Jesus is your friend. He said he did not give it to him because he was a friend. He did not give it to him because he was his neighbor. <laughs> it's a good thing to have good neighbors. The Bible said love your neighbor as yourself. But you don't get your prayers answered because you love your neighbor as yourself. So the man comes back again. <laughs> the man opens the shutters. He said, man, it's almost morning. What are you doing back here? He said, I'm telling you, I need bread for people at my house. And people at my house are hungry. We could say God's house. We could say our house. We could say any house that needs the help of God. We need bread for others. We need something to put on the table or they're going to die. And the man said, you're serious, aren't you? And because of his importunity, because of his persistence, he gave him as many as he needed. Did you see a guy going back down the road? He's, he's loaded down with groceries. He's going back to his house to feed needy people. People who have need. And Jesus didn't stop with the illustration. He made the application. Look, if you will, in verse 9. And I say unto you, now Jesus gets personal. He said, all right, I've told you a model prayer how to pray to God. I have given you the illustration of how important it is. Now I want to talk to you. I love Jesus when he gets personal. We tell our preacher boys all the time, just don't preach generalities. You've got to get specific, and you've got to make application. You'll never get in trouble preaching generalities. Everybody will love generalities, but you start naming sin, they'll get mad. You know, and Jesus said, now let me talk to you men. You say you want to really pray? You want to pray like I pray to my father? Then let me tell you, here's the key. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door, it shall be open. He didn't say it might be open. He didn't say maybe it'll open. He said it shall, without a doubt, be opened. We don't believe it because we don't, we don't pray. 
Or, or we pray, but we faint. That means we get discouraged. We start, but we don't get an immediate answer. And so we get discouraged, and we quit praying. We quit asking. We, we quit seeking. Well, I stayed up one night and prayed. God didn't do anything. Why, why should I continue? No wonder the world is hungry. No wonder people are dying lost. No wonder young people are going away from God. There's no power because there's no persistence. Jesus said it's not because I'm your neighbor. It's not because I'm your friend. It's because of your importunity. Your shameless persistence. Good to see some young people here tonight, but you're not going to find God's will praying one time, two times, five times at a youth camp. You're going to have to pray every day until God opens the door (laughs) because he said he would. But if you stop praying short, you miss out on the blessing. So why has God so designed the Christian life that in order for us to win the victory over the devil, we must pray? I mean, couldn't he just, after we got saved, he could just give us enough power that we could live victoriously over the devil? Sure he could. He's God. But he's designed the Christian life so that we must pray and keep on praying and keep on praying and keep on praying and keep on beseeching the throne of God. And we never get to the place where we stop praying. The moment you get to that place and relax, God lifts his power off your life. The Bible's very clear. We must pray because prayer is the only place that God can show us who we really are. You know, Jesus was the Son of God and He prayed. (laughs) How much more do I need to pray? How weak am I? How frail am I? How prone to wonder am I? Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And prayer is the only place that God can show us how naked we are. Hey, you know, we gold and we're blessed, we're bountiful. He said, no, you're blind. You're poor. You're wretched. You're naked. And unless I clothe you, you'll have no power. Your prayers won't get answered. Your kids will know you have no power. The people that know your life will know you have no power. The only man that doesn't know he has any power is the man that doesn't have any power. Know it. Everybody else recognizes it. He doesn't recognize it. And prayer is the only place. But Jesus said when you pray, you enter into your closet. Why? You can't show off in your closet. You can't display your gifts. In your closet. It's just you and God. And whenever you get in that place, it's woe is me. Woe is me. For I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king. And when we get to that place, we realize no matter how long we've been to church, how long we've been a preacher, a deacon, or whatever, that in the presence of the king, Poor and wretched, blind and miserable, and we need bread. We need clothing. We need power. Why must we pray? Because prayer is the only place that we can have our lives cleansed from our sins. Do you understand what the Bible says? That after we're saved, we're forgiven of our sins at the cross, but after we're saved, we have to be daily cleansed From our sins. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. That's the Christians. And prayer is the only place that God can clean us up. (laughs) It's only in that prayer place alone with God 
that again he takes the hyssop and he dips it in the blood and he sprinkles it upon his child and he says, you're now clean. You're now clean. You can go now and serve me. You can go now with my blessing on your life. You can go now. But without that, you struggle as a Christian with sin in your life every day. Not cleansed. Because prayer is the only place to be cleansed. You meet him at the altar. And that's where the cleansing takes place. I'm not talking about this altar. That's fine to come to this altar. It's your own personal time with God. Prayer time. There's another, not another eye, but you're abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. It's just you and God, and you see a shadow all around you, and then you look up, and it's God. It's God. You're in his shadow, but only in the secret place. You know, prayer, yes, it's a necessity in our life. We must pray. Because prayer is the only place that we gain power over temptation. We're all going to go through temptations. We're all going to go through trials, right? Jesus was tempted in all points, such as we are yet without sin. And he gave us the example that if you go to before the Father, he'll give you the power to come through the trial, to come through the temptation victorious. But prayer is the only place you can tap in. You don't do it sitting in a church service. Thank God you ought to come. And we want powerful church services and we powerful preaching. The only place you're going to get power over temptation is while other people are sleeping, you're praying. You're in the place where Jesus told his disciples, he said, watch and pray. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Do you believe that? Our flesh is weak. Polish it up, dress it up, educate it, but the flesh is still weak. The only hope is for us to come in the place of prayer. He said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. So what did the disciples do? They went to sleep. Late. Too early. They got to sleep another couple hours. Jesus came back, woke them up. He said, I ask you to pray with me. This is the hour of temptation. Will you not pray with me? I mean, this is the inner circle, John. This is the inner circle. This is the best of the best. This is Peter, James, and John. What do they do? They curl up and go back to sleep. But Jesus comes back again. He wakes them up again. He says, cannot you pray with me one hour? Oh, man, we think if we prayed 15 minutes, wow. And Jesus said, could you not pray with me one 60-minute period of your life? And he left them, and what did they do? <laughs> Same thing we do. Curl up and go back to sleep. So Jesus come back the last time, and he said, sleep on now. Sleep on now. The betrayer is at hand. They weren't ready. And they all forsook him and fled. Look at the empty seats in our churches. Where are they? Was it a preaching failure? No. Was it a singing failure? No. Prayer failure. The devil gets in when we'd rather sleep than pray and spend time in the presence of the Lord sleeplessness is what Ephesians 6 18 says watchfulness Jesus taught us the key did he not but I must hasten on quickly to say this in the end why is it that God has so designed the Christian life that we must pray if we're going to defeat the devil amen if we're going to defeat the devil we must pray but that's not where he stopped look at verse 10 then he said for every one how many of you believe that includes you? Don't you like the whosoever's in the Bible? Every one that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. You notice how the translators put the little E-T-H on the end of the verb? 
Why is that? Because it's showing linear tense, continual tense. He that asks and keeps on asking and keeps on asking and keeps on asking, he'll receive it. He that seeks and keeps on seeking and keeps on seeking and keeps on seeking, he will find it. He that knocks and keeps on knocking and keeps on knocking, the door shall be open unto him, not just the person who nominally prays, but the one that persists in prayer because of his importunity. If you want God's power in your life, you don't ask him one time. You ask him and you ask him and you ask him. In desperation, you ask him and you ask him and you ask him. And when God in his wisdom determines to give the answer, it'll be the right time. And you'll have an armful of bread. You want your children to be saved? You ask him and you keep on asking and you keep on asking and you keep on asking and you keep on asking. And at the right time, God will step in and he'll do the delivery. You don't just come to baby dedication or come and say, I want my kids to be saved and pray in a revival service and expect God to do it. He can do it. But he said, I've designed prayer so that you must continue to pray. You must continue to ask. You must continue to seek. Now let's draw this all to a close as we see the end of what Jesus says to us. He makes a very clear application. How many of you are fathers? Raise your hand if you're a dad. If you're a dad, raise your hand. And if you're a granddad, raise your both hands, okay? <laughs> all right, here it is. Jesus said, Jesus said, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? I think Jesus kind of looks at his disciples and he says, you know, your kid comes in and he's hungry. And he said, I'd like a sandwich. And you reach over there and pick up a rock and say, chew on this. Would you do that? And every disciple is shaking his head and Jesus is smiling. No, you wouldn't give him a rock. Or if he would ask for a fish. Hey, I'd like fish for supper. But the dad would give him a snake. An eel kind of looks like a fish. Here you go. Eat, eat this old slithery eel. No. You wouldn't give your son that. If he asked for fish, you'd try to give him fish. He said, well, if he asked for eggs, he wants an egg for breakfast. <laughs> your son, what do you want for breakfast, son? I want an egg. You look around the backyard, and you search through the grass and the underbrush, and you find a scorpion curled up. Looks like an egg. And you walk back in, you throw it on his plate and said, eat this, son. <laughs> There's a scorpion for breakfast. No. And I, I think the men who are, are fathers here, maybe they're saying, Lord, what are you saying? What are you saying? And then Jesus said, here's what I'm saying. If you then being evil... Don't you understand, fathers, who we are? We're sinners. <clears throat> now, we're saved by grace, but we're sinners. And if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? You ever had your kids ask you for something, you ignored it? <laughs> and then they ask you again and you ignored it again. And on the 15th time you say, I heard you. But then you start considering their need. And they come back again and you've, you've told yourself, you know, if they come back one more time, we'll give it to them. It's something they need. How much more shall your heavenly Father, who cares for you, who loves you, and you ask him and you get discouraged and you say, but Lord, you didn't give it to me. And, I, I, and you ask again, and Lord, you didn't hear me. And, and you continue to persist, you continue to ask. And how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit, which represents the Holy Spirit with all of his gifts, with all of his spiritual gifts, that he places in your arms and you go home with an armful of spiritual blessing and power in your life that you never even dreamed possible. You were just asking for 
his help. And he gave you his Holy Spirit. <laughs> you, you were just asking him to get you out of trouble. And instead, he pours out blessing. That's your heavenly father. Now I'm a dad. Now I'm a granddad. Eleven times. Not as many as my brother. Trying to catch up with him. I've always been trying to catch up with him. He's three years older than me. I traveled, as some of you know, all over the country in evangelism. That was, that was a time that Becky and I traveled together, and we went from coast to coast, and south, and north, wherever the doors opened. We promised God we'd go pre- I'd go preach, he'd go share and take the kids. And we'd homeschool on the road. But over these many years, there's been so many times that I've been away from the family. At one point, when I was an associate and I was traveling every month, every month, and for years and years and years I was gone, I'd be away from my family. Back then, you didn't have cell phones. (laughs) You had to pay by the minute. And I would call, no matter where I was, at night. Becky would get on the phone, and I'd talk to her, and then I'd say, let me talk to the kids. (laughs) And then she'd hand the phone to the kids, and they would just jabber and jabber, and they'd go on talking about, you know, all the stuff kids talk about. But it was music to my ear. I'm a dad. I didn't want them to stop talking. And even though it was a great distance, I felt close in those moments. I hated when we had to hang up. So I'd feel guilty and I'd go down to the store and I'd always buy him something, always. Every revival, no matter where I went, overseas, no matter what, I'd, I'd pack it and I'd bring it home. And I'd hide it in my luggage. So uh, we'd have to play a guessing game. I wasn't about to tell them where it was. And I wasn't about to tell them what it was. They had to guess which bag it was in, what it was. And that went on and on. And as long as we played that game, they stayed right close to me. They, they didn't, I'm in the recliner, they're on the arm, they're on the seat. They're, Daddy, is it, in the, is it in the suit bag? Is it in your briefcase? Is it, well, it, which, is it in the big suitcase? Where is it? I'm not telling you. You got to guess. And in between, they're just talking and talking. Could I give it to them immediately when I got off the plane? Yeah in the golf plane. But what do they do? You know, what do you do when you give a kid a toy? You give him something you bought at Walmart or Pennies or wherever it was I picked it up. Well, they run off to their room and they play with that junk. And they forget about old dad. And I'd be just sitting there and say, where'd the kids go? Oh, they're playing with what you gave them. And I believe that God has so designed the Christian life that we have to keep coming back to the Father and keep coming back to the Father and stay real close. He wants us close. He don't want us to get far away. He don't want us to run off with the little gadget we asked for and turn our attention away from Him. He wants us to have that personal relationship with Him, and so He's designed that we keep on asking, keep on asking, keep on asking. For many years we were at the Gateway Church in its heyday when... We averaged over 1,700 every year and had 2,400 in attendance on our big days. There was a lady that was attending, came from a rather well-to-do family, and she would wear the fanciest clothes, every bit of makeup in place, you know, I mean, eyelashes and hair and all the jewelry and sometimes furs. And she'd sit toward the back, sit toward the back. And she heard this truth, and God began to probe her heart. She'd never been to the altar, never. Just sit and listen, you know, enjoy the preaching, go out, shake the preacher's hand, great sermon, then go out and live her life as a Christian. But not that Sunday morning. God got a hold of her heart, and she began to weep at the back. She reached over and took her husband by the hand. She said, will you go with me? I said, yeah. They came down the front, they just fell on the altar. I'm furs, all this, all this mascara is just running down her face. She don't care. She said, I got two lost boys. I got two boys that are on their way to hell. 
And I'm desperate, God. I'm desperate. I'm desperate. That began a prayer series for eight years. Eight years. She continued that prayer life and continued to stay on the altar, both in her home and on the altar at church. Didn't care what people thought about it. In the meantime, God called her first youngest son to preach the gospel. Saved him, called him to preach the gospel. He's still preaching today. Still preaching today. <laughs> Married Danny Dwyer's daughter. Still pastoring today. The other son didn't turn out so well. Came drunk. He wasn't working, he was drinking. He was a deer hunter. He loved to hunt deer. But sometimes alcohol and deer hunting don't mix. So after he got out and shot him a big buck and threw it in the back of his truck, he goes out to celebrate. And he's driving on the way home. He crosses over the lane and he hits a car. He kills the people in that car. He's not phased. He's arrested, and when he wakes up, he's in the hospital with police guards standing at the door. And this same woman called me. And she said, Brother Nate, I've been praying for eight years. Why has God not heard my prayer? Why has God not saved my son? And now there's two elderly people, a grandparents that are dead. I don't know, the Lord just tells you to say something sometimes, and I didn't know what to say, except, well, maybe the Lord is answering your prayer. M maybe he is answering your prayer. So the armed guards are there. <laughs> He's chained to the bed. And then the grandparents who died in the wreck were saved. Their children were saved. They came to the hospital room to see this boy. They came around his bed and he said, oh, I'm so sorry, I was drunk, I didn't mean to hurt him. He said, no, 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 we didn't come to condemn you. We came to tell you, son, that we know Jesus and our mom and daddy are with the Lord and we forgive you. Right there in the hospital room, glory came down. That boy got saved that day in the hospital room. He's serving the Lord. Oh, he had to spend time. He had to go to jail. He had to spend time in prison. But praise God, he went there and he came out born again and he served the Lord. Why? Because God keep, keep on asking. Keep on asking. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. The door. I appeal to you, listen. The only way to defeat the devil is your prayer life. Sorry, I wish there was a... It's the only way. Will you join Jesus in picking it up in your prayer life? It'll make a difference. Will we bow our heads for prayer? Let's stand to our feet, every head bowed, every eye closed in this building. We're going to open up the altars for prayer tonight. We're going to open up the altars. The instrumentals may play something. We don't need any singing. But if you understand this message tonight and you know that you need to pray and that you need to step it up in prayer and there's something in your life that God's dealing with you about as a parent, as a young person.